People keep buying me t-shirts with caffeine molecules on them. I've no idea why. Anyway, let's talk about the chemistry of caffeine, uh, what it is, what it does, how it works, and maybe some of the benefits and drawbacks to it. But before getting on to caffeine properly, let's do some stuff about coffee. So there's this old legend of dancing goats from Ethiopia where a shepherd noticed that whenever his goats ate particular berries, they get really hyperactive and unable to sleep. So the shepherd reported it to a local monastery where the abbot tries the berries and has it as a drink and he's like, yes, that's the right there. But that's mostly legendary and mythological. Historically, coffee's been known for maybe a thousand or so years, but as a drink, it really became a thing in about the 15th century, starting around Yemen and then spreading across the Arabian Peninsula from there. It slowly made its way west over the next few hundred years, having a mix of uses from acting as a medicine to being used as a drug to aid concentration during prayers. And because coffee had the stimulating effect and tended to be consumed in groups of people, it started to be associated with radical thinking and subversive, independent thought. So pretty much every government or major organised religion has, at one point or another, had a pop at banning the stuff outright. Now, in the 20th and 21st centuries, it's been associated with, well, poverty level wages for growers who barely see a fraction of the corporate profit made from it, and also changing land use and rainforest destruction as natural habitats are cleared to make way for coffee plants. It's a problematic indulgence, so you should try to source this stuff as responsibly as you're able. The main stimulant in coffee is caffeine. Chemically, caffeine is classified under a number of different categories. In the broadest category, it's an alkaloid. These are naturally occurring organic compounds featuring basic nitrogen atoms. Most solutions of coffee are actually slightly acidic, meaning that caffeine is most likely protonated, uh, which also helps it make it water soluble. It's also interesting that coffee is acidic because it tastes bitter, a taste that's normally associated with basic solutions. Anyway, the flavor chemistry of coffee is complicated and caffeine doesn't really play that big a role in it compared to many other molecules. Caffeine is also classed as a purine. These are compounds that are heterocyclic aromatic compounds. There's a six membered ring and there's two nitrogen atoms in it. And then there's a five membered pentagonal ring with another two nitrogen atoms in it. I put a pin in this one, we'll come back to it soon. Caffeine is also a xanthine, which is a modified purine. Keeping up with the terms okay? <laughs> and specifically, it's a methyl xanthine. So with all the jargon out of the way, why is that important? Well, it's important because caffeine, due to its shape and size, is part of a large class of chemicals that will all affect your central nervous system. One of the key parts of your nervous system to pay attention to when you're talking about caffeine are the adenosine receptors. These bind to a compound called, as the name suggests, adenosine. Well, this molecule features an adenine attached to a ribose. Again, keeping up with the terms, there'll be a test later. If you stayed awake in high school biology, you'll recognize this from adenosine triphosphate, or ATP which provides energy for many biochemical processes in cells. Uh, you'll also recognize it from DNA and RNA. Adenine and adenosine are integral parts of those genetic building blocks to provide the blueprints for life or some other florid horizon -y Brian Coxie metaphor for DNA. Anyway, it's pretty common for biologically important molecules to look a little bit like this. The relationship between adenosine and its receptors has a few functions, but they all revolve around regulating your heart rate, blood flow, and release of neurotransmitters such as dopamine. And if that sounds like the effects of taking a big swig of extra strong black coffee, there's a reason for that. When triggered, those adenosine receptors make you feel drowsy or sleepy and ready to yawn and go to sleep. If you're awake and uncaffeinated, there should be little or no adenosine in your central nervous system, so the adenosine receptors aren't triggered. But you're working, your cells are respiring, that ATP is going to break down into ADP, then AMP, then finally adenosine, and it will start to hit those adenosine receptors much more, and... <laughs> but what if something gets in the way? Caffeine, because of its methylxanthine structure, is just the right shape and size to interfere with adenosine receptors. Now, 
a chemist may look at those two and say, No, these are absolutely different molecules. Look, one of them has extra oxygens on it, and what? One's a primary amine and the other's a ketone. Why can't you ethanol and methanol and propanol? But it's roughly the same shape and size, and all the hydrogen bond acceptors are in roughly the same place. So a much squishier and not very picky protein, like an adenosine receptor, will be like, well, you're good enough. Come on in, pal. Molecules like caffeine, when working in this context, are known as antagonists. They fill the slot in the receptor, but they don't cause the additional knock-on effects of it. The fit is only good enough. It's still not the exact right thing the receptor is built to respond to. And when those receptors are all blocked up with an antagonist, much less of the adenosine reaches them. Therefore, no drowsiness. So, did you pay attention and spot what's going on? There's a trick there, because the way people talk about caffeine and what it actually does doesn't really match up. People talk about caffeine perking you up and waking you up and stimulating you, but it doesn't really do that, at least not directly. Primarily, it prevents sleepiness and tiredness, so you don't necessarily need it in the morning to wake up, so to speak. But if you consume it a little later on, it'll hold off some of that sleepiness and drowsiness. Good for pulling an all-nighter, for instance. If you happen to suffer from a lot of bad sleep inertia, which is this feeling of tiredness that persists for a long, long after you've woken up, often several hours, then caffeine can help clear that feeling quite quickly by blocking the overstimulated adenosine receptors that are causing it. So if you want to restore yourself with a short nap, then consuming coffee before you go to sleep will prevent that awful grogginess you might feel afterwards. Rather interestingly, that sort of sleep inertia problem is often found alongside ascension deficit hyperactivity disorder, or ADHD. Uh, in fact, one of the reasons we know that ADHD is a genuine neurological condition, and not just as countless people dismiss it as being feckless and forgetful, is that many people who experience it react to stimulants like caffeine very differently to people without it. So, allegedly normal people may avoid drinking tea and coffee like any time after midday because the stimulant will keep them up at night. And the idea of drinking coffee before a nap might sound horrific to them. In which case, great, your, your brain chemistry is probably naturally more balanced. Uh, but someone like me might be able to knock back a double espresso just to feel relaxed enough to go to bed. Uh, because the stimulant effect brings dopamine levels to a more comfortable range and also fixes that sleep inertia problem just afterwards. There are a lot of things we can also add about caffeine. There's how it works with other drugs, for instance, uh, especially ethanol. Uh, contrary to popular belief, coffee will not sober you up. It removes some of the drowsiness associated with alcohol and can even enhance alcohol's de-inhibiting effects and therefore cause you to drink more and get more rowdy in the process. So, you know, just have the one espresso martini. I, I know it's hard, it's the greatest drink ever created, but go easy on them. It also works really well with paracetamol having an enhancing effect there, which is why it's sometimes bundled up in painkillers. So that that's caffeine. It There is an absolutely colossal rabbit hole of detail about how caffeine binds to adenosine receptors and how it interacts with various types of receptor and all sorts of additional molecular biology that's, well, I, I'm a physical chemist with a coffee drinking problem, so I'll, I'll leave it there for now.